As we continue our series of sermons on the parables of Jesus, reading from the 20th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, the parable of the workers in the vineyard, I invite you to hear these holy words. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, You also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, Why have you been standing here all day doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, You also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last worked only an hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, I'm not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want to do with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We all understand that these are unusual times right now, having to stay at home, continually concerned about our health, making sure we have enough food and supplies. But in the midst of all this difficulty, we have to have something that is a constant, something that reminds us of who we are and ultimately to whom we belong. So we gather together this morning to worship, to worship our God, to give thanks for all that God has provided for us, not taking anything for granted, but having an extraordinary appreciation for who God is and what God does. We're grateful for your presence. Let's bow our heads. O oh Lord, in the silence of this moment, prepare our hearts and our minds to hear your word for us this day and work your will in our lives. Amen. Years ago, there was a conference on comparative religions held in England. During the course of the conference, the intent was to try to make a determination about what was unique regarding the Christian faith compared to other religions. What is different about Christianity compared to the other major religions of the world? They began to debate and they talked about the incarnation, the notion that God came in flesh. Well, there are other religions who have claimed the same. That doesn't make Christianity unique in that regard. Then there were those who talked about the resurrection, but again, there were other religions who talked about one whom they worshiped and bowed down before who came back to life. They kept debating, arguing with each other, trying to lay out some kind of strategy when C.S. Lewis himself walked by. He asked, what's all the rumpus? They said, we are trying to make a determination about what makes Christianity unique as a religion in the world. And Lewis responded, oh, that's easy. It's grace. Grace is unique to the Christian faith. Grace, this unearned, unmerited, undeserved love that we get from God simply because God chooses to love us. This extraordinary gift of grace 
that is extended to everyone from the beginning of their existence until their very last breath and forever and ever. So Jesus tells a parable about grace. It is about a landowner who has a vineyard. He needs some workers for his vineyard, so early in the morning he seeks out people to work. He asks them if they are willing to work, and they are for a denarius, for a day's wage. He says, I'll pay you a fair price, and they go off and they begin to work. About nine o'clock in the morning, the vineyard owner does the same with another group of people who then agree to a payment and go off and work. He does it again at noon, at three in the afternoon, and at five o'clock, one hour from quitting time, he gathers a group of people who then work for him. At the conclusion of the day, all of the vineyard workers gather together and the owner of the vineyard begins to pay those who worked only one hour first. They receive a full day's wage. The next group comes forward receiving a full day's wage and finally the last group that has worked all day long simply gets the same as those who have worked only one hour. And they say it's not fair. It's not right. Why should someone who has only worked one hour get the same pay as those of us who have worked all day long? And the owner of the vineyard says, do I have the right to to do what I want? The owner of the vineyard, of course, represents God. And the vineyard workers are those who, in a variety of ways, do the work that we are called to do. Some do it for a lifetime. Some do it for a short period of time, but everybody ultimately receives the same reward, the grace of God extended to every single one of us. And sometimes in our own life, we look at people who seem to be recipients of grace and we're not so satisfied that they get to receive the same gift as someone who has been faithful for a whole lifetime. It doesn't seem fair, it doesn't seem right. Why should someone who has been a faithful Christian her or his whole life, who has tried to continually do good, receive nothing more than someone who has been a pretty sorry and lousy person their life, but toward the end of their life, they change as a recipient of the grace of God, they become the person God would have them to be, and they receive the same reward. I have a friend who lived a really tough life. He was a criminal. He was a drug addict. He got himself into trouble the majority of his adult life. He hurt people. People hurt him. But for whatever reason, one Sunday he decided to go to church. He didn't look like anybody else in the church. Covered in tattoos, very rough looking, The kind of clothes he wore were different from virtually everybody else. But when he came into the church, something extraordinary happened. He was given this gift of grace. He was immediately accepted for who he was, just as he was. And as a recipient of that grace, he received something extraordinary, a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ, who altered the way he lived. He now had concern for other people. He now expressed love. He now got a good job and worked hard and became an honest and faithful man. Sometimes people we see who are recipients of grace, we believe are undeserving. They shouldn't be entitled to the same thing that those of us who have worked so hard as followers of Jesus Christ to achieve should get. But God says, that's my call. I decide who receives grace, and I choose to extend it to anybody and everybody. So what Jesus tells us, among other things in this parable, it's never too late to be a recipient of grace. Those who worked only one hour get the same benefits as those who worked the entire day. If you think about it for a moment, Jesus, writhing in pain on a cross, has a short conversation with a criminal 
a man who has done something so heinous that his life is now in jeopardy. He too is being put to death. But he has a conversation with Jesus, and as he almost breathes his last breath, Jesus says to him, today you will be with me in paradise. Did the man live a lifetime of dishonesty? Did he hurt people constantly? We don't know anything about him, but we do know he's an example of someone who even in the last moment receives the gift God has in store for all of us. We hear about deathbed confessions, people who at the last moment of their lives give their life to Jesus Christ, and as a result, we believe they too receive the same reward as anybody else. Recipients of God's grace. So we remind ourselves that when we get put out with other people who seem to benefit when we've worked so hard, we remind ourselves that we haven't always been the most faithful of people ourselves. And there are times when God could have easily condemned us. There are times when God could say to us, you've abandoned me, you've left me alone. But despite that fact, we are still recipients of the same grace extended to anyone else because God chooses to give it to us. Remember Jesus tells the parable of the prodigal son, the second of two sons, the younger one, who goes to his father and says, I want what's mine. It's a sign of disrespect to his father because he was not entitled to receive anything until his father's death. And in some ways, what he's saying to his father is, you're dead to me. But he gets from his father what he would eventually be entitled to, and he squanders it. He wastes it away. But then he reminds himself that at least at home, if it was even a servant, he would get three square meals. So he starts to make his way back home and his father runs and embraces him. And there is going to be a big party and a big celebration. When the older brother is told about this, in his own way, he says, that's not fair. Why should he be one who receives so much when he's been so unfaithful? And the father says, it's a celebration because he's returned home. God so longs to be in relationship with us that God will seek us out. If you look at the story of the landowner that we talk about today, he is the one who seeks out the workers for the vineyard. They don't come to him, he goes to them. God continually comes to us and offers us something extraordinary and beneficial for our own life. It is called grace. So we do need to remind ourselves that there are occasions in life when we, like the landowner, need to remind ourselves to extend grace to other people. I would hope for many of us in a time like this, we have tried to reevaluate our whole lives, to prioritize and to maybe for the first time in our lives, put our faith above all else to remind ourselves fundamentally and finally, what is it that we have if we don't have faith? Everything is futile, everything else is fleeting. We have to have someone and something that we can cling to, hold on to, find strength in. And why can't it be the understanding that through whatever it is we go through, we believe in a God of grace and a God of love and a God of certainty who is going to give us whatever we need to be able to do whatever it is we need to do. I invite you to think about the ways in which you can extend grace to maybe people that you've been frustrated with, maybe people you don't like. Maybe this is an extraordinary time for all of us to really take into consideration what is it that we can do for someone else whom we have often ignored or had nothing to do with. Maybe it's time that we remind ourselves that as recipients of God's grace, it's our responsibility to share that grace with others. That's ideally what the church is like. When the church gathers together, we don't have a litmus test to make a determination about who's worthy and who's not. The truth is none of us are really worthy. But all of us have an opportunity to receive a gift from God called grace. No matter where we've been or what we've done, God is so grateful and happy that we would try to make God a priority 
that God is willing to say, my doors are open to you, please come in. As undeserving as we are, God cannot wait to give us this gift. So maybe one of the things we can do right now as the church, because we are spread apart and because we cannot gather together, is to think individually and then collectively about what we can do to make grace available to anyone and everyone. It can be something as simple as showing respect for people that we've had very little to do with up to this point. It can be reestablishing and reconnecting with somebody where we have become disenfranchised from them. It might be a chance in some way for us to do something we've never really thought about doing up to this point that will make a fundamental but profound difference in the life of somebody else. Maybe it's saying something we need to finally say. Maybe it's writing down something we need to finally write. Maybe it's making contact in some way with somebody else. But all of us right now need grace. We don't need any more bad news. We've got plenty of challenges ahead of us. What we do need instead is to know that we have a God in Jesus Christ who loves us no matter what. And it's never too late for any of us. It is a chance now, if we've never done it before, to give our lives to Jesus Christ. Or if we have at some point, but he's no longer become a priority, we reprioritize and put him above all else. Or maybe if he's been a priority all along, we just reinforce that once again. This is our chance to do that. And I promise you, when we do that, suddenly we begin to recognize and feel a greater power greater than ourselves, a strength beyond our own capacity to realize that will hold us up and remind us of how much we are really loved. It's our time to extend grace. Philip Yancey wrote, if grace is so amazing, why don't Christians show more of it? Maybe this is the time when we show more of it because it is so amazing. And if God is willing to give us another chance, another opportunity, and God is willing to love us unconditionally, this is our time to be able to do that for each other as well. And what a profound difference we could make in the world. No longer would there be all the political divides, no longer would be all the rancor, no longer would there be all the vitriolic language and all the kinds of things that we say to each other because we feel like we have a right to say it, even if it harms someone else. Maybe now what we can do for the first time and maybe now what we can do that makes something happen that is powerful for other people from now on is show grace, a grace that we receive. Remember, God continually brought back the Israelite people when they time and again showed their lack of faith. God would get frustrated and even angry. But ultimately, finally, God would bring them back because God desperately wanted to be in relationship with them. Jesus had a group of 12 disciples who oftentimes lacked understanding, who frustrated him, who on occasion, I'm certain, made him angry. But he never gave up on them, and eventually those same disciples, by the grace of Jesus Christ, would tell the world he is risen. And maybe you and I are the kinds of people who have not been honest with ourselves about our own need to be recipients of grace. Maybe there's no more condemnation, no more criticism, but instead we find ways to lift up and to encourage and let that other stuff go. It just doesn't matter anymore. Grace holds no grudges. Grace forgives. Grace moves on. Grace doesn't lash out. Grace is not snarky or condemning. Grace is concerned about the very soul of every human being. And grace personifies love. And the way we're going to get through all of this is to find a source of strength, to find love and opportunity, and to count on God to be there for us. We're all broken. We're all in need of a Savior. And the moment we acknowledge that, 
that we can't do this by ourselves and that we are not perfect people. We rely then on one who has taken upon himself all of the sin of humanity and died to that sin and conquered it for the sake of all of us. As broken people, how important it is now to recognize the one who is rock solid, the one who is our firm foundation. Eugene O'Neill said, man is born broken. He lives by mending. The grace of God is glue. That's what's going to keep us together. That's what's going to keep us strong. I pray for all of you that we find within ourselves the capacity to recognize a loving and grace-filled God right now and that we would once again prioritize our lives in such a way that God is first and God from now on will always be first. And if that be so for us, then the way we treat other people, the way we evaluate our own lives, the way we go about living will turn this world into the kind of place where the kingdom of God is evident and the reign of God is clear. Blessings to all of you. We pray for you. We love you. And we are a people who make a decision now to share grace with each other as recipients of that same grace God gives to us. Hallelujah. Amen.